Good morning. Welcome to our briefing this morning. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. We are very pleased to be uh, hosting this briefing this morning with the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Both of our organizations have a long-time interest and, and work underway in terms of bringing together people from the policy community, from the private sector, uh, and, and also with, um, with experts from academia uh, and interested parties. And we both feel very, very strongly that as we look for solutions in a very, very fast changing world, the most important thing is to bring thoughtful people together to ask ourselves probing questions to make sure that we listen to each other as we really search for solutions that can really make sense. This briefing comes uh, as the follow-up to a forum that, or a dialogue that has been underway uh, over the past uh, day, day and a half, that the German Marshall Fund of the United States has been sponsoring. And I might mention that the German Marshall Fund, uh, its, its energy and society program aims to advance transatlantic leadership on scalable and innovative policy and business solutions to achieve a secure, affordable, and low carbon energy future, to reduce the risk of climate change, and to conserve natural resources. All very important values that are also shared by the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And the German Marshall Fund was established in 1972 as a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization through a gift from Germany as a permanent memorial to the Marshall Plan and the assistance that it provided. And so the German Marshall Fund has had a very, very strong presence in the United States as well as in Europe. And these dialogues on, in terms of very, very key issues that are important to both sides of the Atlantic have been a very, very important piece of their work over the last few decades. And so this morning's briefing is in terms of thinking about energy infrastructure and those power pathways and how they are being confronted with new challenges, uh, some very, very interesting changes, um, and changes that are happening quite rapidly. And how is it that we should best handle this change from an industry perspective? What does this mean for policymakers and how should we go about it? And so you will be hearing more about the dialogue that has been underway. We are very, very privileged this morning that we are going to hear from the co-chairs of that dialogue. And I want to right now uh, turn to our co-moderator for this morning's briefing, Neil Brown, who uh, has is part of this dialogue looking at the um, transformation of the energy power sector and what does what does that mean what what direction shall we go what are the questions that are being asked and Neil I have known for a number of years because of all of the years he has served and been a senior staffer uh, here in the Senate uh, where he worked for many years with Senator Dick Luker uh, and worked on energy security on the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and was the co-lead for nonproliferation through the Nunn Luger Global Program. Uh, Neil served as a senior advisor to Senator Luger of Indiana and was the director of his energy initiative. And I have to tell you, um, when Senator Luger retired, or left, the, left the Senate this last uh, session, uh, I had an email, as did many of us who had known Neil, and it simply said, well, I'm leaving the Senate. I don't know exactly where I'm going, but I'm going out traveling, and so you'll hear from me at some point. <laughs> and he did exactly that. Um, Neil is now serving on the board of directors of the Luger Center. 
He is also senior advisor at Goldwyn Global Strategies and is a non-resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund's Energy Transmission, Transition Forum, um, as well as serving with the Luger Institute for Diplomacy and Congress. So at this time, I'm going to um, turn to, to Neil, who will uh, introduce our speakers this morning, but we're going to handle this in a little bit different way in that Neil will be uh, moderating a discussion uh, with, with our speakers and he will also be introducing them and uh, so that we will have a chance to hear from them in, uh, as they have a conversation about some of the key issues that were coming up in the dialogue um, and, and how they might be approached. It is a chance to really probe to understand more and then we will also, after, um, after we have that kind of an uh, informal discussion, then we will also open it up for Q&A with all of you because that is such an important piece of the, of the programs that we do. Neil? Thank you, Carol. Uh, I'm impressed that you read my email, and someday I'll tell you where I went. Um, but it, it involved a lot of hiking and uh, a little bit of tear gas. Um, you know, I, I want to thank EESI for co-hosting us. You know, after eight years working down the hall, you sort of every day you receive a, a, a number of invitations to various events. And um, I would always open Carol's emails because I knew ESI would, would bring really top quality people. Um, uh, I don't include myself in that today, but, um, but certainly uh, my, our two discussants um, who, are, who are really um, real leaders. I, um, just a, a word on the German Marshall Fund of the United States um, Energy Transition Forum. You know, there's, a, there's a lot of energy um, activities in, in Washington and, and around the U.S. And I was really drawn to the ETF uh, after leaving the Senate because they recognize that the current path we're on isn't working. Um, we, we see incremental change, but it, it, it's really not sufficient um, for the security concerns we face, for the environmental concerns we face, and as I really learned yesterday within the power sector for our economic concerns in terms of the rate models that, that we've become accustomed to throughout this country and, and in Europe. And so the, the Energy Transition Forum really operates off two premises. Um, one is that the energy world is increasingly complex. Um, that may seem obvious, but when you really dig into what that complexity is in terms of the players involved, the the economics involved, the time spans involved. It's, it's something that is a challenge for anybody um, to deal with, you know, let alone when you're you know, sitting in, in offices around here trying to deal with you know, different constituent issues every day and, and different um, interest groups that, that appear um, uh, as, as, and bring in their, their issues. So it's not good enough to be pro you know, whatever, pro solar, pro coal, pro efficiency. Um, you have to think through the entire range of implications, and you know, you know, when you push the lever here, then something up over there is going to going to pop up that you have to deal with. And the second premise is that in this environment, the solutions will take very diverse coalitions. I'm not just talking about political coalitions to move a particular policy proposal. I'm talking about inclusion of a number of players, of industry players, civil society players, that are directly impacting how the system is going to hold up in terms of reliability, in terms of sustainability, in terms of, in terms of cost. And so yesterday I was uh, pleased to, to join a group of, of really experts from both sides of the Atlantic coming from these diverse pieces, um, led by our distinguished uh, two chairmen here. And some of them are in the room, and so I, I invite them to participate in the discussion at any point. Um, certainly correct me when I, when I overstep. Um, and let me, let me introduce you. I think you all have a, uh, a bio biography of our, of our two speakers. Um, so I just want to make a, a couple highlights. Um, first is um, uh, Daniel Dobany, um, who I want you all to help me welcome to the Hill because this is his first time here. Um, and I guess with you know, what you usually see in the news about the Hill, I'm, I'm impressed that you wanted to come. So thank you very much for coming. 
Thank you. Danielle has a, a, a background uh, training as an engineer, but has also led for, for decades um, private sector concerns on energy, particularly energy transmission in Europe, um, building up um, one company to, to eventually be the fifth largest um, uh, TSO in Europe. And um, he also was the first leader of, you know, correct me if, it's, if, I don't, if I say the name wrong, but the, the, the European network of transmission systems operators for electricity. For electricity. Um, so now, if you think that dealing with states is difficult, U.S. states, try 41 TSOs in 30 sovereign countries. 34. 34 sovereign countries. Well, I forget about some of them. You know, <clears throat> so they all blend together you know, the further east you go. Um, <laughs> You know, and you know, so thank you for, for joining us today. I wanted, to, I wanted to point out that um, in your honor, because this is the first time you're on the Hill, that the Senate leadership canceled the resolution on military strike in Syria <laughs> and instead is dealing with an energy efficiency bill just specifically for, for your interests. And now, Chairman Wellinghoff, um, you know, people in Washington know him very well. Um, there are a few people who are as influential in the, in the power system in the entire country. So I, I want to just say two things that, that I've learned about him. One is that he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Um, when he, in his previous position in Nevada, wrote uh, RPS um, that you know, I think is, is very well regarded within, with, among advocates of, of um, renewables, but when he took over chairmanship of, of FERC, I mean, he, there, there's a couple ways to do that sort of position. One is to kind of do what, you know, what, what your predecessors have done and, and kind of maintain the status quo, move with inertia. But um, he decided that he would take on some very big issues, um, uh, integration of renewables in wholesale markets, uh, aggressive demand response mechanisms, um, infrastructure efficiency, you know, we usually think about efficiency uh, in, your, in your washing machines and, you know, these sorts of, you know, appliances on the demand side, but he's looking at the entire network and the infrastructure in it. Uh, the second thing I would say about Chairman Wellinghoff is that he's extremely courageous because, you know, he, he essentially at this point has a free pass from the Hill, but he voluntarily chose to come back up to this room. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we thank you for that. I, um, I don't want to, to, to talk too much. I want you two to talk together. So let me just start out with a, with a question, if I can, and ask you both to respond and to respond to each other. You know, if you read a energy bill um, coming out of Congress, granted, we don't do that that many these days, but if you read one, it tends to look a little bit like, here's a title for solar and for wind and for coal and for natural gas and for batteries for vehicles, and basically it's, it's a, a very siloed approach. Um, let's take this, this uh, technology we like, let's push it um, for various reasons, and, and very good reasons uh, by and large. But, but that's not sufficient. You know, it's, you know if, if we think about efficiency, we want to push efficiency you know, one of the themes of our discussion yesterday was, well, you really need to think about what that does to, to how rates are determined, as just one example. So I wonder if, you know, think about, you know, our audience today and, and online, what would be, for each of you, the couple top systemic challenges um, that we face when it, when it comes to the electric grid? And feel free to pose solutions, too, if you'd like. <laughs> Easy solutions. Thank you. I first want to thank you for that introduction, although on the, on the courage part, I knew I was going to be on this side of the table, so it was a lot easier <laughs> to come up today than it is sometimes, although I do uh, enjoy providing Congress with uh, information when, they're, when they do request it and, and don't, don't mind that. And I first also want to uh, uh, thank EESI for hosting this, uh, a great organization that puts on uh, tremendous uh, informational programs for Congress, and, uh, and uh, it really uh, is an organization that I appreciate very much because it makes our job easier of helping to educate 
uh, the Hill about some of the, cr the critical issues that we do. And I also want to thank the German Marshall Fund for the opportunity that they've provided to FERC and to me to be able to interact with our European counterparts, which is a very uh, important uh, undertaking because we're learning a lot. I learned a lot yesterday from Daniel in the workshop that we were in. Um, <clears throat> and. Um, We'll continue to do so because I think uh, we have a lot to learn from each other. But with respect to your specific question and uh, those systemic uh, issues that we really need to look at, first, I, I think it is important for us to look at the grid uh, as a system. You know, the grid really grew up um, as a very um, disaggregated, in this country anyway, and I think it's been somewhat different in Europe, and, and I'll let Danielle talk to that, but uh, the grid in this country did grow up as a very um, disparate collection of isolated pockets where you had a load in New York and there were uh, growing up around it a number of uh, resources, uh, tr traditional uh, central station generators, whether it be coal or gas or a little later on nuclear. Uh, really started out with, with hydropower, actually, uh, in the New York area. But in each different community, they had those resources grow up to serve those communities. And then the communities decided, okay, we want to start uh, interconnecting and exchanging with our neighbors. So they put in sort of weak ties between each one of their neighboring entities. And then, you know, this grew up a little bit more and a little bit more. And we finally, you know, knitted together the grid that we had, but it really wasn't planned as an overall integrated system. So we have to look at it um, from that standpoint of how, uh, you know, its, its early roots grew up. Whereas today we have a much different situation. <clears throat> and I'd, I'd, I'd compared and contrasted to um, the natural gas system. Natural gas system in this country grew up much differently, whereas in natural gas we had one area of primary resource back in the 30s and 40s, and that was the Permian Basin and the Oklahoma-Texas fines for natural gas. We had tremendous amounts of gas in one very specific location, and we had a need for the ability to distribute that gas all over the United States. And so as a result, Congress decided that they empowered FERC with the authority to actually site uh, natural gas transmission lines and, 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 uh, and permit those lines. And so we were the, the sole authority to the, determine uh, how those lines got built and, uh, and oversaw those lines. Unlike transmission lines where today, still today, FERC has no siting authority uh, or it's actually very limited under one, one provision of the 2005 Energy Policy Act in, uh, in very specific um, narrow circumstances determined by the Department of, of Energy in, 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 um, in uh, co congested corridors that are very few and far between, uh, but ultimately uh, very little siting authority that is, is primarily still retained by the state. So very interesting contrast there between you know, how we got a natural gas, a ro very robust and very uh, complete networked natural gas pipeline system in this country that virtually can get natural gas from Louisiana to Montana and uh, from uh, the Canadian border to uh, Arizona uh, at a price that's all very uniform. Uh, unlike our system of electricity in the electric grid where we have prices that vary by a factor of two or three 150 miles away from each other in places in this country uh, based upon congestion and based upon the inability to move power uh, efficiently. So from a systemic s standpoint, you know, one thing that I look at is, you know, how we can make the grid more efficient, more efficient from a standpoint that we can ensure that prices can be more uniform throughout the country and, and we can deliver lower prices to those places in the country that now have uh, higher priced electricity through uh, providing more uh, efficient uh, a grid system overall. That's that's one systemic issue that I think is 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 probably the largest one, the most critical one. A second one is is just like the natural gas sis situation that we had in the 30s and 40s, where we had natural gas in one location. Of course, that's changed now. We now have natural gas almost everywhere. We have with shale gas. We have natural gas, uh, shale gas in in, in Pennsylvania and New York and Ohio. I heard the other day there's a huge shale play in Georgia. There's a huge shale play in California. There's you know there's there's natural gas everywhere. So so from a, from a trans 
adaptation and, and resource development standpoint, that now has changed. But from the standpoint of electricity and electricity resource deliverability, we now have a different situation where there are emerging technologies, that is wind, and, and, and wind really isn't that much emerging, it's becoming very mainstream, and solar, and certainly uh, uh, central plant solar uh, is being developed, and the cost of those two resources is falling with the advancements in technology. But the uh, highest quality of those resources are located largely in one, one, one area of the country. Wind mean primarily the, the highest quality wind is in the middle uh, portion of the country, Midwest, from the Dakotas all the way down through Texas. In that strip of the country, there's a tremendous amount of wind, uh, and some over in a little bit farther west in Montana, Wyoming, and down in New Mexico as well. But that wind area, again, um, can be developed very economically, but the problem is there's not a lot of people there, or at least that's not where the majority of the population is. The majority of the population in this country, of course, is on the two coasts. So you have to figure out how you can deliver that very low-cost, uh, effective resource to those people. Well, you need transmission to do that. And so we're looking now then, like we looked at natural gas back in the 30s, at a situation with uh, electric resources where we have it all located in a, in a fairly narrow area, and it needs to be distributed across the country to provide lower cost, uh, more affordable energy. And of course, solar, it's the highest resources in the southwest area, in, in my state, Nevada, and Arizona, Southern California, and those areas. And again, how, to, how can you develop it and then deliver it to other portions of the country? So, you know, th that's another challenge uh, s systemically, is to, is to look at the changing grid. And then the third systemic challenge I see is, is, a, is a very interesting one, just from this allocation uh, standpoint and a standpoint of, of, uh, of how you finance new transmission uh, projects. And there's actually two components to this systemic issue. Uh, one component is the fact that we're seeing m many, many more people uh, moving towards distributed generation. You're seeing lots of people who are very interested in putting in uh, solar PV, solar photovoltaic systems, large installations in California, large installations in Arizona, and other areas in the Southwest. And there's even areas uh, where there are uh, state incentives uh, outside of the Southwest. New Jersey is a, one of the leading states in solar PV, for example. And to the extent that we have people that are interested in, in increasing the amount of distributed generation, that lowers the need for these long distance, high voltage transmission lines to move power across different parts of the country. And so that really re reduces the, uh, the push to, to move uh, for a more networked grid uh, to get these economical resources of wind out of the Midwest I talked about and to make the grid uh, more uh, efficient from a standpoint of moving power from one place to another. And the second part of that that also is, is uh, disrupting to some degree uh, the uh, push to and the impetus for uh, a bigger, stronger grid is the fact that our load uh, growth is decreasing or is, is actually declining. The, the rate of growth is dec declining. It's not going negative yet, but it's, it's flattening out in essence. We're not seeing the load type, type of load growth that I used to see in Nevada uh, back in the 70s and 80s where Nevada's low growth was growing at 4 to 5%. I mean, that was, you know, that's a fantastic growth. Of course, it's nothing like the Chinese that are growing at, you know, we're growing, growing at 10 to 12%, and now they're only growing at 7%. But, um, but we're growing at virtually 1% or less and, and projected by EIA to grow at, at 1%. Uh, or less in this country. So again, you know, that so takes off sort of the impetus for, you know, building this bigger, stronger grid that I talk about. Um, so, um, you know, it, it really is going to be a huge challenge systemically to determine how to make the investments properly and how to do them in the way that we don't have stranded costs for those investments and to still ensure that we can have the most efficient system possible to deliver low-cost, reliable resources, energy services, in essence, to all of our consumers. Maybe uh, uh, everything you said, by the way, is very close to, to what, what could be said about Europe. I will, I will highlight maybe uh, some of the differences, uh, or maybe not differences, but different orientations. First of all, the way the, the, the power system in Europe uh, uh, grew 
and is like it is today uh, is, is very close to what you said, is that you, you go back to where you had coal in some locations, hydro, and then the industry just, well, was close to that and close to the industry, you, you could found the first large cities. So the system is the same. They grow from small locations that were driven by mostly geographical resources. And then one of the advantages of electricity is that when, when you interconnect two small systems, you share reserve. So there is a win-win situation immediately. And this is the way, uh, the reason why uh, in Europe you, you saw the interconnection growing pretty fast in the beginning. Uh, you had a core countries, a core number of countries where the interconnection was, was sufficiently significant that the, the uh, um, incumbent companies decided to even get closer in terms of exchange of, of reserve, uh, how they do balancing. And um, I think it's not uh, just uh, uh, like that, that the first uh, association of, of transmission and generation in that time, uh, operators in Europe, appeared uh, uh, two years before uh, the signing of the treaty creating Europe. Because once you interconnect two power systems, you're obliged to talk to each other. Because you become, of course, better, cheaper, but you are interdependent. Now, if, if, if I position myself in, in the middle of the 90s, uh, Europe decided to move to the next step, a fully integrated uh, electricity and gas market. And to do so, uh, a first uh, directive, the equivalent of a, of a bill, uh, was uh, voted and, and uh, progressively translated into national law. This objective was exactly to decrease the price. Uh, you have to put yourself back in the 90s, there were uh, sufficient overcapacity in generation and transmission that by doing this, you would expect a decrease in wholesale price. And this was also the case. But then the idea to uh, move Europe towards a carbon neutral uh, area of, of the world induced what would become a game changer. And this game changer is not as strong in the US for the time being compared to, to Europe. The game changer was to decide in 2007 that we would have globally, for all member states, 20% of the whole energy consumption that would be delivered by renewable energy sources. So when you translate that for electricity, it means that roughly by 2020, for whole member states of Europe, we would need something around 33 to 35% of renewable energy sources. And like it was said yesterday in our dialogue, if you would have asked engineers uh, of the power industry in Europe, is it feasible to have 15% or 20% of uh, renewable energy sources in the network, the answer would have been no. The fact is that it is. Uh, it's not all over Europe yet, but in, in some places of Europe, like uh, uh, in one of the four area in Germany, we are already above this percentage of renewables. So this triggers another phenomenon is that instead of only increasing transmission capacity to increase or to improve the working of the market, because the more capacity you have, that was your point, the more capacity you have between areas, the more you can trade, you can exchange. Now the question is, how can we increase transmission capacity fast enough to pace with the fact that, unfortunately, Wind is blowing where the industry is not located, most of the case, and is the same for sun. So, so we, are, we are back in a situation where we need a lot of transmission capacity in order to benefit from the fact that you have a lot of wind in the northern part of Europe, and especially in the northern sea and the Baltic Sea, and you have a lot of sun in the southern part of Europe. So um, we have there a systematic, not only problem, 
because we, we cannot, like that, increase transmission capacity. Uh, I understood uh, from uh, my different trips to the States that they uh, build anything, anywhere, anytime is, is common to the US, is common to Europe. And uh, we are no more in the situation of the early 20s and 30s why, where it was not difficult to show that if you would interconnect two small area, the reliability would improve. The reliability in the US, the reliability in, in Europe is such that difficult to convince inhabitants that building new transmission lines will do something good for them because it will not change the, the, the reliability. Uh, so we are, we are confronted with that situation and um, it has significant impacts on, on the way the market is, is working. Uh, another element uh, that shows how important it is to look at the whole system, and that was your question, um, is that, uh, for example, and, and we can talk hours about that, but for example, uh, the fact that we have such an important share of renewables in some places of Europe, and given the fact that we created common markets, this means that f between, for example, Germany, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, Netherlands and France, we couple the market. This means that you have, when there is no constraints for exchanging electricity between these countries, you have the same price, wholesale price, for the same hour all over the place. You will have two different prices if you cannot move enough energy as, as the traders would like to see happening between two countries. The consequence of that is that because you have a lot of renewables in the northern part and, and, and mostly in Germany, you, you, and this wind and sun is, is zero marginal price. Of course, it's subsidized, but I will, I will just look at the part uh, on the fact that it's a zero marginal cost. It, it drives down the, the, the wholesale price because it comes, of course, first in the merit order. It receives also by law priority. And simultaneously, the shale gas in the US has been um, translated in Europe in coal prices that have been decreasing systematically for the last two years. Just to give you an idea, coal price in 2011 was something around $125 per ton. I think a year later it was 90. Okay. If you add to that in Europe, the, the price for carbon decreased simultaneously for other reasons from something around 13, I think, euro to uh, 7, 6, even 4, you had a strange situation that the more you had renewables and the more you had shale gas, in Europe, less gas became interesting. So today, gas units are just not running. And what are we doing? We, we run coal plants. So it shows how important the, the system is, because it's not only the European system here. It's, it's what's happening in the States and what's happening in Europe, and the two together create some strange uh, situation. And um, like you were saying, John, is that the, 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 the second biggest change, to my opinion, is the fact that we're moving, and I know yesterday we could see that there was not really a 100% agreement among, among us, uh, but we are moving to, to, to a more hybrid uh, power system. We, we, we have uh, contemplated a fantastic success during the last century, because I think that we all should agree uh, it's not because I'm an engineer from the power business I'm saying that, although maybe a little bit. Uh, we have to recognize that the power system is one of the most beautiful human invention and that it works without major glitch for more than 100 years. There are not that many things that humans have invented with such a result. But it has been driven by several, I would say, pillars. Uh, one of them is the, the merit order, this means that you, 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 you start power plants based on the fact that they are more and more expensive based on the increasing demand. Uh, unfortunately, with, with zero marginal price energy, a viable nature, the merit order doesn't work anymore. So this is one of the pillars that is gone. A second one is that, well, even if you would have decided to build a power plant a little bit too early compared to your business plan, you knew that, well, demand would grow. 
it would always grow. It's been growing for the last century. It doesn't grow anymore. Third pillar, the bigger the system, the bigger the power plant, the cheapest it would become for the customer. We've been living in that situation till, I would say, mid of the 90s. This pillar is gone too, because you, the, the advantage of having purely centralized large units, because of this inroad from cogeneration units, from uh, local PVs that someday, don't ask me when, will we'll have grid parity, we'll do not, they will not need any subsidy anymore, will uh, wind also, it gets closer and closer. So the third pillar is gone too. And, and now, and I see that, um, is it in Bloomberg, is it in, in different newspapers in the States, in Europe, the basic fundamental of the business model of uh, generating companies is gone. It's not been replaced by anything else. And there again, we are faced on a systematic uh, issue, is that how can we solve that? Knowing that by definition, because we, we didn't talk about uh, the major part, but I'm sure we'll talk about it, because I know that you are very uh, care about them, the customers, the customers, they want only cheap energy, of course, the cheaper possible especially those who are in competition uh, worldwide. So, so we have a lot of constraints around us, and the whole system is, is, is now shaking. And uh, we're moving towards hybrid systems, thousands and thousands of small generators at home, in small companies, in large companies, some big units, a lot of wind, sun, um, this, is a, this, is, this is a mutation, it, it's not only an evolution, it's a real mutation. The only problem is that we cannot stop the system for the weekend to do an upgrade. <laughs> it's, like, it's like having several airplanes taking off at the same time from different airports and we are expected to land in the same airplane and passengers didn't notice anything. Pretty hard to do. Thank you very much. Uh, you ended with, um, with a thought on, on customers. Um, that's something that we talked a lot about yesterday. And um, it, it, one of the themes seemed to be that customers are, have traditionally been treated as kind of a one-way street. I mean, I, th I think somebody used an example of customers sometimes don't even have names. They're just sort of called subscribers or, or you know, they're, they're the recipients of power. They're not active players. But we're seeing something very different now. Chairman, could you talk a little bit about what it means to make customers, to put customers first in the electric system, how we can do it, what the potential is, and what, what are the lessons that you would, you would share with, uh, with Danielle as he goes back? Well, I, I think customers have, have taken on a whole new um, um, level of respect, I think, from the from the electric industry. Certainly, uh, at the point that the demands have started to go down, that people uh, in the industry have recognized that you know customers can make choices and customers can do things that actually will affect the industry dramatically. They're not just a statistic, a meter, or a rate payer out there. Uh, but customers, you know desire services. I mean, they really want energy services. No, no customer really wants to buy electrons. No, no one in, in the room here really wants to have a whole package of electrons sitting in your house. What you want is you want, you know, a cold beer and a hot shower, basically. I mean, you want, you, you, you want to have, you know, those types of services that provide you uh, the comforts that you uh, desire and the commercial businesses and the industries want those services that provide those end uses that can allow them to continue to carry on their businesses profitably uh, and, and make, uh, you know, make their way in the world. So ultimately, you need to have affordable energy services, and they have to be also reliable. Well, it's, it's changing dramatically now how they can be delivered, as we talked a little bit about uh, the sort of revolution in the distributed energy side of things. Things are becoming much, much more cost effective. As Danielle said, it's no longer a matter of economies of scale. You can uh, conceive of uh, situations where there is grid parity with uh, solar photovoltaic systems, for example, and in places in this country, such as Hawaii, of course, with very high rates and very good solar insulation, you've got 
virtually grid parity with respect to putting in solar vo uh, solar photovoltaic systems, and that you know will happen in other parts of the country where where we have higher levels of solar insulation. Uh, California, Arizona, Nevada, and the Southwest, as as rates go up and prices for solar uh, systems come down, that's going to continue. Uh, and of course, we do have a tremendous amount of natural gas in this country, and natural gas is a, a fuel that can be used at a distributed level as well, with cogeneration and and small microturbines and fuel cells. We're starting to see fuel cells that, that in every five years are going to be just there in five years that we've seen for the last 20 years. That you know they, they're going to maybe maybe get there uh, to to some point in in time. So so customers now want to make choices and have control. Uh, much more than they did in the past. And other things that are kind of intervening are things like Hurricane Sandy. People, you know, understand now that, gee, maybe I shouldn't be depending upon those lines that are, you know, going down my street. Maybe I need to ensure that, you know, when something happens, I can generate power for my own house or business in, in some way. And so uh, they want that control to be more localized. In addition, consumers now have the ability through communications and control to interact with the grid. They can actually do things that allow them to control their energy costs and their energy prices in ways that they never could before and act as a two-way um, vehicle between uh, the grid. They can act as a grid asset. And in fact, we have in the mid-Atlantic area here, our, uh, our, um, our uh, grid operator is called PJM, which stands for for uh, historically Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, but it goes much beyond those states. It goes into into uh, Delaware and D.C. and Virginia and Ohio and it goes all the way to Chicago and is the grid operator, controls the grid for that whole area for wholesale uh, grid prices and, and the wholesale market. And in that wholesale market, they actually have, <clears throat> under FERC authority and FERC approved tariffs, tariffs that allow consumers to bid in to that grid to provide capacity. They can do that on a three-year forward capacity basis. They can bid in what they call demand response, which is varying your usage during the day at times that the grid operator determines is appropriate to help the grid be stabilized. And they can also bid in energy efficiency, which is basically lowering the overall usage as well. And they can get paid for it. They can also bid in a demand response for energy, and they can bid in demand response for ancillary services, which is a balancing service for the grid as well. So there's a whole array of tariffs, of, of actual on-the-book um, items that can allow consumers in that PGM area to actually bid in their variances of their uses in very wa various ways of their end use in their building, in their commercial facility, in their residential facility, to help them control their costs, because they actually get payments back from PGM. And in fact, it goes all the way to, I was having this discussion last night with a, a group I was meeting with, uh, a gentleman who was developing a new electric car, electric vehicle. And um, PGM now has the ability to actually have electric car batteries when they're charging to be used when they're plugged in to the grid to be used to provide regulation service. And those automobiles can actually get paid regulation service payments, 7 to $10 a day, to, in fact, provide that regulation service while the car is actually charging. So we have a much different world where consumers now are actually interactive, can be interactive parts of the grid. Now, that's not everywhere in this country. That's only where we have organized markets, and there's seven organized wholesale markets in the country, mostly in the east, northeast, uh, Texas, and California. Uh, there's not an organized market in the southeast or in the rest of the west outside of California. But that's changing, and consumers are understanding that there's value to those organized markets, and that value, in part, is allowing consumers to be part of the system to actually use their loads in ways that can help the system and help them uh, recover some costs as well. Just maybe to add, to add a, a few points of what you said, John, is that uh, just to give you uh, a sense of, of the speed of change, I think five years ago, uh, four or five years ago, nobody would have talked about capacity markets. Nobody. Need your own generation, 
nor on the demand side. With one exception, of course, large industries. Large industries who can regulate a little bit their demand or stop uh, producing if it doesn't take longer than a few uh, tens or uh, whatever number of minutes. Uh, with this exception, nobody would have talked about that. And then suddenly, uh, again triggered by uh, the evolution of the power system, the energy mix, suddenly we, we needed capacity. And, and in, in Europe, capacity is today a very hot debate about how to organize capacity markets for generation. Uh, because, of course, you can organize that uh, different ways. And uh, you may be sure that if, if you are not trying to give a direction, um, each, each member state will do it differently. That's the way humans usually uh, have creativity. Um, the problem is that if, if you are doing that in a fully integrated uh, market, like we, we will start in Europe um, in 2014-15, um, it can create major disturbances. So capacity market is, is, is a new kit on the block, but we are talking about it as if it exists for the last, maybe not century, but more than that. But it shows how fast it goes. The same holds true for capacity market, but this time um, with, as producer, uh, the demand side. Uh, and and uh, there is, for me, and I'm coming to the States uh, quite often, there is a major change in, in uh, and I'm sure you are, you are at the base of that, uh, because customers now have the possibility to, to bid in the market, providing they have the tools, providing that the business case is the right one, of course. But, but it shows that the, 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 the prosumer approach, both being uh, consumer and producer, is something that is slowly but surely is going to change completely, again, the way the power system is, is managed. We, 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 have, we are used to, to handle the power system from generation, very high voltage going down to uh, your home. Uh, already today, for example, in my home country in Belgium, at a certain moment of the time, a distribution company is injecting in the transmission network and, and a few hours later will be consuming, will be taking energy out of the network. This is a revolution. Honestly, nobody developed the, the network ever to be in that situation. And again, the speed of change is, in my view, and we agree on that, is really uh, exponential now. Because as soon as you reach at the level of residential consumers, then you have millions of people that may or may not, up to them, decide to, to play a role in it. And we have, again, to cope with changing the system at the right time. And, and this is where you are coming in, in the play, because very often these changes are only possible if the legislation and the regulation allows it or makes it easy or easier. But I'm sure that in, in, in the US, like in Europe, in some countries, it's pretty hard to be able to, to allow that because the regulation, the tariff structure is not being made for that. And, and, and this is where um, I think one of the tension, uh, and, and you pointed out what the system point of view um, is of concern for me, is that the speed of change driven by technology driven by the fact that the consumer is getting more and more informed and wants to do something, is going so fast that, that legislation most of the time will be uh, trailing the reality. And if we want to achieve uh, a modern, uh, as much as possible, CO2 neutral uh, power system, we have to go fast. And, and, and I'm not sure that it's possible to, to, to get the whole regulation and legislation moving fast enough. That, that's a concern I have. In just a, a couple minutes, I'd, I'd like to turn it over for audience questions and discussion. But I, I want to ask you both to respond to one other thing, because you've, um, you've thoroughly confused me. 
I thought I was. I, yeah, I mean, I, I was doing really well after yesterday. I thought I thought that you had you'd, you'd uh, educated me, um, but you you seem to be talking about two pretty different things, and and I'm a little unsure how to integrate them. On the one hand, you've both mentioned the need um, in the U.S. predominantly in the Midwest and mountain states in Europe, in Northern Europe, to pull large amounts of re renewable energy to integrate it into the grid. You're, you know, really what you're doing is talking about a, a, a much more integrated grid than we have today, um, a, a grid that can move power across jurisdictions very quickly. Uh, my guess is that we probably, you would probably suggest some regulatory changes to enable that. But on the other hand, you're also talking about the powerful consumer. You're talking about the um, you're talking about distributed generation. You know, you know, if I you know were to go out and and buy a what is it Nissan Leaf or whatever it is, that suddenly I can be my own little power plant driving around and selling when I'm when I'm parked and and having my my latte. So. I mean, I, I guess I'm, it, it seems like these are very different things. I mean, it, it, it seems like you're saying, well, let's have, let's have a lot of autonomy, but also let's have a lot of integration. And, you know, I'm, I'm sort of perplexed by this because I need to know where to, to place my bets, you know, when I, when I go for online trading this afternoon or whatever it is I'm going to do. So help, help me figure that out. You know, are, are, is, this, uh, is the dichotomy that I see wrong? No, it's right. How, how do we move forward? Well, I, I, I think they potentially can be complementary. However, the, 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 the tension and the fear is that we'll overinvest in one or the other. And, and that, that is the concern that I have. And I'm not sure how to make those decisions. I hope that the markets, because I do think that the market is the most efficient arbiter of making those decisions rather than, you know, certainly FERC shouldn't be making those decisions. I think FERC should allow, allow the markets to do that. And we generally try to do that uh, with respect to uh, setting up structures so that both distributed resources and central resources can all play into the overall grid system. We, we would like to see both types of resources participate as part of that market and, and hopefully do that with as even a hand as possible, not leaning one way or the other. I think that's very important. But, but ultimately, you know, decisions are going to have to be made as to capital investment in either, you know, overall large uh, transmission networks to deliver some of these centrally located uh, lower cost renewable resources to loads and or to ensure that we have a grid that's adequate to support the multitude of distributed resources that consumers will choose to put in based upon their own market choices of putting in PVs or buying electric vehicles or putting in cogen and, and fuel, fuel cells, etc. And so how that all will play out and how we optimize those, uh, those market decisions um, is not going to be up to FERC, and it's going to be one that hopefully we can set a structure that allows it to all be done fairly, openly, and transparently in the, in the best, most efficient way. And if I had the answer, I would not be at the table here. I would be on my computer, you know, betting certain companies against others. But, 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 but I don't have the answer as to, you know, are we going to be pr predominantly a distributed uh, energy system in this country uh, 10 or 15 years from now, or are we going to be, you know, a much more networked uh, uh, central, central system uh, based upon uh, uh, lower lower cost resources that are brought from from long distances. I mean, I'm I'm not sure which which is going to be the ultimate one, and and I think there will be certainly a mix of both. But I can't tell you the proportions of the mix, and hopefully we won't uh, wrongly invest in one to find out that that's not needed anymore because everybody's put in solar PV, and you know we we built all these big transmission lines that we don't need to use. Um, and invest invested uh, society's money, you know, unwisely. We we need to figure out how to make those investments wisely. Maybe maybe trying to to to, to bring a little bit the two together, um, but I have I have of course to to to, to say first that what I'm going to say is only valid as long as as uh, the holy grail 
of the power system is not, is not available, storage. meaning storage. Huh? storage. So as long as storage is not available, what I'm saying is right. Otherwise, forget about it. Um, so as long as we have no storage, you, you still will have the necessity to, to balance your grid. Uh, because electricity is a product where, unfortunately, uh, you have to produce exactly what is consumed at the same moment. If not, you may have some uh, major uh, problems. So uh, the future, of when, I, when I'm looking to Europe, uh, you will need very strong, uh, very high voltage network to bring wind energy, uh, solar energy to the location where you have demand. Because demand, in Europe even more than in the US, demand doesn't move. Facilities are where they are, the industries are where they are, the people are where they are. So, so you, you will need that, to bring that. Um, thereby, uh, given the size of Europe, if you want to benefit from the fact that it's not going to be windy all over Europe at the same time, or sunny uh, all over the same time, the more you can benefit from the fact that you have a huge, a huge system, you can, you can move very quickly from one side to the other, and it decreases the cost, of course, of balancing. This is one of the reasons also where uh, the more you have transmission capacity between uh, countries, between area, the better it is, mm -hmm. especially in a world where you have a lot of uh, renewables. Now, at the same time, uh, you will have much more decentralized uh, generation, and, and we have seen it the last 20 years uh, in Europe and in the States is the same. And this process is not stopping, it's going on. Uh, because the advantage is if you have a cogeneration unit, uh, you, you can benefit from both electricity produced and the heat. So, so it's, it's beneficial uh, economically, but also for the environment. But these two work together nicely. Uh, you, you need, of course, much more IT, much more electronic, much more data, whatever. But this is, this is only technology. Um, the holy grail of the system is, is storage. The day you have storage as a, as a reasonable uh, equipment, then, then the world changes again. Uh, and and it, it's impossible to tell you where we should go. And, and this is one of the major problem of, of this industry is that you take a decision today and in terms of asset infrastructure you will have to live with during the next 20 to 50, 60 years depending mm -hmm. on the asset. So any decision we take, it means that two, three generations will have to live with. And in the fast changing environment in which we are today, uh, it's easy, when I read the media, I'm talking in Europe, uh, it's very easy to criticize the, the, the governments and the energy ministers and the European Commission, oh, they should have known. For God's sake, how could you know? Uh, could we know that shale gas would drive the coal price down? Three years ago, nobody would, would think about that. So, so you have a whole industry that is moving, and at the same time, and this is not part of the gene of this industry, which was a, an industry where you had a business case, and most probably this business case would be realized during the next 20 years. And you are now in a situation, or you come up with a business case, the only thing you know is that it's wrong, maybe in six months, two years. And, and this makes job pretty difficult, not only for the industry, the investors, because they would like to have some reasonable return for that, mm -hmm. but also for policymakers. And this is where, if you allow me on your first question, you were saying, when, when we look at the bill coming out, we talk about PV, etc. This is where I think a major change needs to be done, is that you have to look at the system as a whole and, and try to, to, to fix and take the least dangerous approach, uh, dangerous in the sense, lost investments. Okay. So in other words, keep my cash under the mattress. <laughs> and, and if I just add to that, just one, one thing, and, and I think, because Daniel just made a, a great point, I mean, we have to look at the whole system and make it as flexible as possible. Just imagine if you were told you had to make the decision between an iPhone and a Samsung, and you had to keep that device for the next 20 years. 
You know, I mean, it's it's you know, you'd say you're crazy, but that's really what we're doing yeah. in, in the electric industry. It's exactly what we're doing. So. Exactly. Yeah. And now we can feel totally reassured that we're all going to go crazy, right? Um, uh, but I'm so glad that storage came up. That was an issue that I was hoping that you would also address, uh, since it is a game changer. And and I, um, I think there are all sorts of questions now that that we've got that we want to begin to address. And if you could identify yourself when you ask your question, let's start way in the back, Angie. Beeler with Walmart. Um, I wanted to first of all thank Danielle from coming clear from Europe to share his expertise and his knowledge and best practices with us here today. Thank you for that. And uh, for Chairman Willinghoff, um, on behalf of our company, a proactive energy user in the U.S. and striving towards a 100% renewable aspirational goal and a lot of energy. Um, I thank you for the things your commission and you have done uh, inspiring customers to do demand response in the markets and participate um, in DG and allowing us to do solar on our rooftops, many things like that. My question to you is, like you said, choice is very important to customers. It allows us freedom to innovate, create new things. Um, my question to you is, ISOs and RTOs are wonderful, and they serve a wonderful purpose, and um, so do the states that we're involved in. But due to the piece, piecemeal approach, so much of the ISOs and RTOs are totally different in their offerings, and I would like to see some collaboration or some kind of information exchange among these, how we can get these best practices instituted among all, all of these organizations for consistency and growth of te green technology across the country, as well as states. We might have to go to one state and say, great, let's do this. The next state we go to, we don't have those choices. So how do we get together your advice on collaborating and sharing these positive things to move forward? Thank you. That's a great question, Angie, and it, and it really is a, a great challenge for a company like Walmart or any company that has facilities and assets all across this country that has to deal with you know, 50 different state regulatory entities and then the different uh, RTOs that are under our jurisdiction and the way those RTOs are set up and as, as I mentioned there's seven of them six of which are under our jurisdiction one is under the jurisdiction of the Texas Public Utilities Commission in Texas is uh, those are all voluntary organizations that then through their stakeholders in the organizations sort of decide upon their own rules and and structures although they 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 put those rules in a framework that FERC uh, has 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 put in place in, in rulemaking. So there is some structure to it, but they're giving a lot of flexibility and, and latitude. And like uh, uh, Angie from Walmart indicated that they are, they are different. Uh, they do have different rules. And so we're trying to, to make them uh, bring together the best practices as much as possible. In fact, there is an RTO ISO council that meets on a periodic basis. So the executives of those RTOs do meet. But even those executives and the management of the RTOs can't, in essence, force their stakeholders to enact or adopt uh, a particular uh, uniform rule. So it is a matter of, of a process. It's a very painful and slow process. I wish there was a better way, but um, you know, because we we do have to bring in uh, all the viewpoints that have interests. Uh, in those RTOs, uh, it continues to be to be slow and, and uh, interesting. That uh, I, I found out that that Europe has a, a code, and maybe Danielle, you might want to talk to talk about that. Where they seem to be quite more advanced than we are of trying to get this more uniform throughout uh, a jurisdiction and and their market practices. And so you might want to talk to how you did that. Well, in fact, uh, the, the, uh, I mentioned that in, 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 in 96, with the first directive, the idea was to create a, a single electricity market. Uh, we are 2013, so it took some time. Uh, but, but we agreed on a market model, um, the same for 
uh, all Europe and, and, and uh, also the, the uh, countries that are not part of, of, of uh, the European Union but that are interconnected. And this market model is, 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 treating, is dealing with all uh, yearly, uh, monthly, uh, daily, intraday, intraday fundamental for uh, renewable. And um, the, the question, of course, is how do you implement that? Because, because it doesn't work if, if you implement it uh, one country each year. You, you, you need to create a single market, preferably maybe not in a single day, but at least sufficient that, that it deliver, delivers the added value for, for the consumers. And so um, with the third package, in fact, uh, with different documents among which the third directive, uh, the Commission came out, the European Commission came out with the idea of, of network codes. Uh, these network codes are, are, are not to be compared with, with the codes uh, with which uh, you are familiar in the US, uh, how to run a power system um, that are uh, put forward by NERC. Um, these are dealing not only with that part, but also how the market is going to work. And the specificity of these network codes is that in, in the European legislation, uh, they, they, it's a whole process that had been described with, with uh, a consultation from all stakeholders, uh, both at, at the level of the association of the, of the 41 TSOs, who have the, who have the, uh, the, the great honorous responsibility to draft these documents based on a framework guideline, and the framework guideline is written by uh, the Association of Regulators. It's not like FERC, but they, they work together. So, so we have a guideline, then our experts are, are writing down the codes, it's been discussed with the stakeholders, then, then the uh, Association of Regulators of Europe hold their own consultation, then it goes to the European Commission, and finally it's put forward in what is called the comitology process to a representative of each member state. And when it's voted there, the next day it enters into force in all concerned member states. And I think that uh, the driver behind that, more even than the internal electricity market, is the fact that we had this target of 20% renewable by 2020. Because in order to make it possible, you need to be able to trade uh, electricity in intraday as close as possible to real time depending on the weather conditions. And if you do so, you, you cannot go from one, one country to the other with different law, different regulations. You have to harmonize that. You have to make them compatible. And I think this is, this is a real fundamental building block of a good working uh, internal electricity market. Okay, we'll go here first, and then we'll go at the back. Go ahead. Thank you. In the U.S., we're struggling with a, a paradox, as I see it. At the national level, it's pretty clear that reliability is desirable, and in integrating the grid further improves reliability, and that it's the lowest cost solution overall if you look at the nation as a whole. But we're not a nation as a whole. We're individual interests, very parochial, and... You see that in the southeast, for example, uh, there's been a big concern about letting the low-cost energy out of the southeast and flow somewhere else and then having to pay more for it with replacement power in the southeast. The chairman pointed to the fact that in some places you can be 150 miles apart and pay three times the power. Well, the guy who's paying three times less <clears throat> sometimes wants to keep it that way. We have the intermediate states that are moving power from one state to the other who don't necessarily see the benefits of putting in transmission in their states to flow due to the environmental concerns with transmission. And then we even have had the situation a few years back where 10 or so of the governors in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic states with the high cost states wrote in and said, we don't want a subsidized national grid to bring us power in from cheaper places. We want to build it ourselves because we think we make lots of jobs and it's good for our local economies to build high cost power locally than get low cost power from afar. So, I would imagine those same forces were in Europe and even stronger, and yet, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you've overcome those. So my question is, what's different about Europe? How did you overcome those parochial concerns, or maybe, you know, to what extent have you overcome them? And if so, what was the 
driving factor that you all could pull together and rally around. I, I wouldn't say the, the issue is solved, but at least we are working on it. And, and, and uh, uh, all member states agreed that they need to do something about it. And this is already a major step forward. Um, I will answer your question in two steps. The first step is that you were talking about difficulties sometimes to build transmission lines because country A, uh, for whatever reason, doesn't want to uh, get electricity for country B or doesn't want to be obliged to sell electricity to country B because their rate would be higher than if they remain. The same issue you have in Europe. So uh, Europe identified the issue and um, they recently, in fact last year, uh, voted uh, a new directive where they created the concept of project of common interest. So, so it's, it's in the making. It's really, it started last year and we will see what it delivers. And, and um, they did two things. First, the project of common interest, they need to deliver, uh, they need to be analyzed in terms of uh, welfare for all concerned countries. So, so a country, whatever Z, for example, will not be able to say, I don't want to have it because I don't see immediate benefit. So, so it, it, uh, it goes cross-border, first thing. And the regulators will play a role in that, in that uh, decision, of course, the commission, the regulators. Uh, the second thing is that we absolutely need to accelerate the permitting issue. It, 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 we are in a situation where you can build very quickly although I'm sure people would like to see it even more quickly, you can build very quickly uh, wind farms somewhere uh, onshore, and it takes years before you, you have enough transmission capacity. So in this package also, they put a results obligation on the member states so that they will deliver a yes or no for permitting in a given number of years, in fact, three years. That's fundamental. Now, I want to see it working, okay, but, but the steps have been taken to tackle these two major issues. But, but of course, um, the proof lies in eating the pudding, and, and uh, we will see it in the next three to four years. But it's recognized as an issue. Now, what was the driver? The driver is indeed the fact that we have this 20% target about renewables. Because the more you have wind and sun, the more the systems are interconnected. There is not a single member state in Europe that today is able to open the interconnections with neighboring countries. Sometimes they believe they can do it, but it's not true anymore. And this is very positive also for the integration of Europe, because we, are, we rely on each other. This is the only way to go forward. Uh, back here first. I'm interested, I'm interested if you could please discuss the types of risks that in this country, as opposed to Europe, would come with transcontinental Translate, uh, transmission of electric power to energy security? The types of risks that you'd see? The types of risk, well, uh, um, I guess a non-security risk, the biggest risk I see is financial. I mean, again, it, it, on the issue of a stranded, stranded asset, if we put assets in and deter determine that the need really wasn't there for the, the capacity that's going to be utilizing that line over a period of 30, 40, 50 years, but from a, from a, from a um, if you're talking about from a, a physical and cybersecurity perspective, uh, cer certainly, you know, um, adding any infrastructure adds additional potential cyber nodes and, and additional potential uh, points of entry to, uh, to uh, people that would uh, try to do us harm. From a physical standpoint, um, I do think that we, if, if we do start adding um, large, long-distance lines in this country, we do need to start thinking about uh, having regional disconnects where we can isolate regions of the country so that if, in fact, there are um, um, outages in certain areas that may be because of uh, security risks, uh, either uh, natural disasters or um, actual uh, physical uh, actions against those 
areas of infrastructure by by uh, uh, act, certain actors, then we need to ensure that uh, the grid uh, can be stabilized. And right now we have three interconnects in this country. We have the Eastern Interconnect and the Western Interconnect in Texas. And uh, those three interconnects, I think, are vulnerable from the standpoint that uh, there are a number of nodes that hold them up. Those nodes are uh, high voltage um, transmission substations. And those substations are vulnerable, ultimately. So we need to do what we can to minimize those vulnerabilities by ensuring that we can isolate uh, portions of each one of those interconnects as regions uh, through perhaps uh, DC ring buses. And, and that's something that people have looked into, of putting in DC ring buses in certain areas. And, and we've got some studies at FERC that, sh that show how that might be done. I know that there were actually studies done in the Midwest as well. Midwest ISO looked at that when they were looking at long distance lines uh, going from the Midwest to the, the East Coast. So there are physical security issues that dirt certainly have to be dealt with. I think the biggest risk is uh, potentially uh, attacks on the system uh, at, at, those, at those critical nodes. Okay, here first. Hello, my name is Philip Brown. I'm with the Congressional Research Service here in Washington. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about power markets and what I've observed, especially in, in Europe and within some countries in Europe, is that as the percentage of renewable power, mostly wind and solar, has increased, it's starting to result now in a discussion about the right type of power market design that would incentivize all types of power generation capacity. And as you mentioned earlier, the, the merit order based energy only market when you have zero marginal cost renewables being bid into the system is not feasible uh, in a large renewable penetration environment because even at 100% everybody gets paid zero so it's not going to work over the long term. So uh, taking that into consideration, what, what do you think would be sort of an ideal market design or market structure that would uh, provide the right incentives that would provide that would result in adequate reliability, uh, efficient operations from the perspective of consumer prices, um, and and so on. So I'd be interested in your perspective on that. If I knew it, I wouldn't be here. I'm afraid. <laughs> I would be in some nice island enjoying uh, uh, sunshine. Um, now, I think we, we, w what we are sure about is that the, the, the tariff structure we've been used for, for the last century um, doesn't fit anymore, but not only for generation, also for demand. Um, we, we've been used, uh, it's in the States, the case in many, in many states, in Europe mostly, to have a, a very part of the fee, a very small part of the fee that is a fixed uh, uh, cost, and then you pay by the energy you consume. Um, unfortunately, uh, if I have PVs on my roof, I will uh, reduce my energy consumption, but I still use the assets when there is no sun. Uh, so, so you need to include some capacity payment. The same holds true for generation. Uh, generation uh, power plants were built usually depending on the technology, for gas, for example, to run minimum 4,000 hours a year. Uh, we are entering already today in some part of Europe with, with power plants running 1,500 hours a day. So that goes to closing them down, basically. So there, too, you need to, to pay capacity. That's the that famous capacity market. And, and, and uh, I, I heard that in the States, in, in different location, different areas, we think about rediscussing this, this tariff structure. But it, it's a pretty hard um, problem to solve because, of course, once you touch that, you touch at the basis of this whole industry. But I think we, we all agree that we need to fix that. Um, if I knew how to do it quickly, uh, fast, uh, I think other would have thought about it before me. Uh, so, uh, so it's a hard problem, but, but like all these problems, um, it's, it's now a tipping point and, and, and you cannot avoid tackling it. And in Europe, people are, as in the States, uh, discussing this more and more at regulatory level as well as at the, at the business level. Carol, can I By the way, there is no ideal situation, unfortunately. 
If I can cut in for just a minute, I mean, we were talking about consumer choice, talking about distributed generation, real diversification of, of the power portfolio, integration. Um, some security issues have been brought up, which I think are very useful. But what about, what about the environment? I mean, I think that we're assuming, let's just take consumer choice. I think we're assuming that consumers will choose cleaner, lower carbon energy. But if they actually have the choice, they may not choose that. They may choose the cheapest source around, um, which you know, may be a more conventional type production. So how do you, it, it, one, is that a worry? Um, two, how do you deal with that in terms of setting the, 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 ba the bounds of, of the market? Well, certainly in this country, I mean, it is a worry for me uh, personally. But from a, a policy standpoint, a perspective with respect to a, a FERC, we're really an economic regulator. So as, a, as an economic regulator, we do not incorporate into uh, our market structures uh, things that are not now in federal law um, and, and, or state law. And in fact, we've, we, we have recognized, though, for example, in our uh, transmission uh, planning rule, Order 1000, uh, that as part of that planning that the uh, planners, which would include uh, state stakeholders as well as generators and transmission owners and consumers, uh, d distribution utilities, uh, that they need to recognize uh, in transmission planning those aspects of pub public policy that will impact uh, transmission planning. And part of that public policy certainly is the 30 or so renewable portfolio standards in the 30 states uh, and so jurisdictions that have passed those types of standards are around this country. So to the extent that there are those public policies that are now incorporated in federal laws, which could be uh, federal uh, emissions requirements in our Clean Air Act, or could be state requirements in a state renewable portfolio standard, those are to be recognized in the planning for transmission uh, that FERC has uh, jurisdiction over the, the bulk power system and, and incorporated in. Uh, beyond that, I mean, there is no um, uh, currently um, federal law that uh, imposes any uh, costs on carbon. Uh, for example, and so that isn't incorporated into uh, the aspects of the, of the regulations that we uh, issue from FERC. Uh, again, we are primarily an economic regulator that incorporates in, you know, those those economic general economic principles principles and requirements that uh, are currently in law. Europe is is taking their uh, a different approach, uh, where. Um, it was decided, as I said in 2007, to have clear objectives in terms of not only percentage of, uh, of renewables, but also decrease uh, the amount of CO2 produced by 20% and to increase energy efficiency by 20%. Um, with the exception of the energy efficiency, two other uh, objectives are mandatory. So they, the member states were obliged to uh, translate that in their law. So by doing so, uh, you still have the choice uh, as a consumer, but, but whatever is your choice, uh, there is a clear evolution towards a, a more, uh, let us say, environmental friendly uh, energy mix. Uh, so, so it, it, this, this is quite a difference between, for many years between, between the U.S. and, and Europe where um, there is a more, let us say, public orientation towards uh, a CO2-friendly future. But, but Germany, you said, is in rapidly increasing its coal yeah, use. Yeah, each, each, each member states may decide to do more than, than, than what is, is put forward by the European Union as a whole. Germany, for, for many reasons, uh, decided to, to uh, quit the, the, uh, the, the nuclear power of the energy mix and, and to do it uh, in, in several steps, but fairly uh, aggressively in terms of timing. Uh, by the way, my home country did the same. Um, this was triggered, of course, by the, the uh, uh, situation in Japan. Um, um, and, and it's also an example of, of unforeseen events far away that triggers significant impact in Europe. Um, uh, these, these policies need, of course, to be fine-tuned in function of the evolution 
for example, uh, PVs, of course, if, if, uh, the price of PVs have uh, uh, diminished uh, incredibly. Uh, I'm sure that the governments who, who decided to support PVs or wind uh, would have done it in a cheaper way if they would have known beforehand that PVs would, would decrease in price, but they didn't know it. So, so I think um, uh, it's easy afterwards to criticize and to say we should have done it better. Uh, unfortunately, the future is unknown. It doesn't mean that you cannot improve. And, and I see that, that uh, through uh, uh, the media, through political contact, there is, it, 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 it's understood and, and Europe will, will take act on it. Uh, that, that's the only thing you can do is improve the situation. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more question, if anyone? Okay, go, go ahead. Sorry about some two, but uh, this one's for the chair. <laughs> um, when you were talking about the best wind resources in the country, you looked inland to resources that are hundreds of many thousands of miles away from the population centers. It seems like Europe has looked offshore uh, and has significant amount of wind penetration offshore. So, just so uh, you can comment on thoughts on the offshore wind industry potential in the U.S. and also I know that the, the government, the federal government does have quite a bit of citing authority to offer transmission offshore, but that might be a way of reinforcing the grid in that area where you can't control that situation. Right, and, and, as, and as far as citing, what little citing authority we do, we have we have citing authority with respect to any uh, hydro systems in this country. So it's a hydrokinetic system in the ocean. We have citing authority with respect to that uh, system, and then of course, uh, from a standpoint of uh, uh, of a certain distance offshore, there is the Department of the Interior that would have citing authority with respect to any uh, lines that would be necessary for wind. I think offshore wind has great potential in this country. It's just a matter of cost right now. And what I was referring to was ultimately the, the least expensive resources from a standpoint of capacity factor and, and overall cost would be the ones uh, currently onshore. But I think uh, definitely in, in Europe has had some tremendous experience with, with offshore wind and they continue to improve uh, the technology and continue to reduce the costs, I think there will be uh, in our future a, a, a great deal of potential for offshore wind. I know the Atlantic Wind Project is uh, one that we've been looking at for a number of years uh, that I know that has some very large backers. Google is one of the backers behind that project. And I think uh, there's no question that uh, given the, uh, the, the financing support for those projects that they, they are going to move forward. Well, and as the bells are ringing, uh, I want to thank our speakers very, very much, um, and also to thank Neil um, for moderating um, uh, with me this, this important briefing. And I think it really tees up a whole number of issues that we really need to do much more in the way of follow-up in terms of then now thinking about what is the role that needs to be taken by policymakers at the national level and in conjunction with um, state regulators in terms of dealing with some of the um, inconsistencies or certainly different policies, which therefore are really also creating impediments as we look at the um, uh, fast changing uh, in environment with regard to the grid and with regard to the issues around the increased amount of of distributed generation that we're seeing. It, to really bring that forward and to solve problems, it's going to need all of those different policymakers. it looks like to, to come together. So it's another challenge, but it's another big opportunity for all of us to, to come together and, and look for that. So I want to thank you all very much for, for coming and being part of this discussion. Please do help yourself to some of the pastries and coffee. It looks like we've got quite a lot over here. And, um, and thank you again very, very much. And hopefully we'll see some of you on Monday at our next briefing, which is on short-lived climate pollutants, taking a look at hydrofluorocarbons, black carbon, and methane, because they have an outsized impact on climate. We're looking at low carbon issues and how they affect things in the power sector. So we encourage you to come on Monday for that as well. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.